Welcome to the Stereoactive Movie Club. My name is Jeremiah, and I'm here with Alicia, Mia, and Steven, as well as our special guest for this episode, our good friend, Max Gorenson. And we're going to be talking about the 2014 film Boyhood, directed by Richard Linkletter. But before we go on, let's hear from everyone about one movie they've watched recently that they want to talk about here. Max, as our guest, do you mind starting us off? Not at all. I'm going to cheat, though. I got to say, too. I got it. Because, all right, so 2022 to me was like the ultimate year of the unsung movie. Uh, I can't remember the last year in the last, the last time in the last 10 or 15 years where I loved so many movies, um, especially movies that people didn't see. So I got I to gotta shout a couple out. Uh, there's a movie called A Love Song, which I thought was so beautiful. Uh, it might be an all-timer for me. Um, and, uh, another really interesting one, uh, lower on my list, but like, I just love the filmmaker so much, uh, something in the dirt by, uh, Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead, uh, who I think are one of the most two interesting pairs in that filmmaking right now. Uh, they write really, really, really smart, uh, weird, darkly funny, low budget, almost like if, if, if Richard Linklater, um, did, uh, low budget sci-fi movies or something. Um, so yeah. And actually, since I, I know in years past, the last couple of years, you've done the virtual Sundance thing. Yes. So did you do that again just mm. recently? I did. I, I watched a paltry uh, 10 movies this year. Last year, I saw 18. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, oh, my wow. God. <laughs> so can you tell us one movie that you're excited for people to see that, that you were able to see early because of watching Sundance virtually? Well, I mean... My disclaimer would be that this was a lot less of an exciting year for Sundance than last year was, and they also um, limited the selection uh, mm. of the movies that you could watch uh, remotely. A lot of them had to be a lot of the more exciting ones had to be in person. Um, but I saw a couple that I really loved. Um, I think an interesting one to talk about will be a film called All Dirt Roads: Taste of Salt. Um, and the hook for me was that it was produced by Barry Jenkins, and I think that. He's just magical. So um, it's uh, it's kind of abstract. Uh, it if you're if you're someone that can't really hang with uh, slow movies that are not plot heavy, it would be a nightmare. But it's uh, it it follows um, it follows the life of a black woman from Mississippi through several decades, um, but through uh, kind of jumps around uh, in the timeline and just very very intimate little moments there's very little dialogue there's a lot of uh focus on on the senses there's lots of uh lots of texture in 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 the way it's shot and uh you see lots of you know like like fingers running through silt or or blades of grass um so you kind of like feel like you can you can feel like the the hot heavy air of mississippi and you can hear you know the the uh the the bugs at night um so it's uh yeah it, it was really really different um and really cool all right well thanks for telling us about that um steven how about you what's something you watched recently um i watched the movie confess fletch um which came out in 2022 and i saw it on showtime recently it's with john ham and if anybody's familiar with those fletch movies i think chevy chase was the lead um and there are older movies i think that came out in the 80s um but yeah it was it was really fun it wasn't as um it was a lot of detective work but also i like john ham's deadpan kind of humor so it worked for me but there wasn't a lot of like funny disguises and it was less goofy than i expected but i still did really enjoy it and it looked good it didn't do that well i think um in the box office i think it was sort of partially released and people didn't even know it came out so yeah i really liked it i think paramount i think it's paramount they did not do a very good job of telling people this movie existed i i also saw it when we had a uh hulu showtime add-on for a week um, and <laughs> I, I, I thought it was really fun. It's the kind of movie that like in the nineties or early two thousands would have come out in theaters and done, done well enough that it would have been profitable. And if I'd gone to see it, I would have been like, that was, that was worth seeing. It's fine. It was good. It was. Yeah. 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 I laughed a lot. It was, yeah, it was an enjoyable movie to watch on a Friday. So but yeah, they, anyway. you're right. They didn't really tell anyone it existed and it went to showtime. <laughs> it's not like on a platform that like. It's not HBO Max or something, which everybody is exactly knows. It's a little more ubiquitous. Um, anyway, Alicia, how about you? What's something you watched? Um, I watched a lot of movies over the last whatever period of time it's been since we last recorded. Um, yeah, but been for a some while. reason, today the only movie that I can remember is um, Banshees of Inisherin. 
which I think probably a good number of people have seen by now. But um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I really loved all the performances and the, the donkey, and the <laughs> <laughs> just everything about it. It's a it's a really sort of dark story, but um, it's a very it, it kind of reminded in terms of the movie we're talking about today, it's, it was sort of, it sort of felt a little more real and I like, you know, I enjoyed that. Yeah. I really like that too. Uh, Mia, how about you? So I watched black Panther Wakanda forever. Um, Cause now it's streaming and it was very not real um, <laughs> in contrast to Alicia's movie. Um, but I, I really liked it. I thought it was good. Um, you know, I, it wasn't as good as the first one, but honestly, like I realized watching it that I was like, I barely remember the plot of the first one. I more remember like the set pieces and the settings and, you know, the actors, but I thought they did a really good job of like paying tribute to Chadwick Boseman in like some really touching ways. And I think the bigger issues that the movie raises about like, how do you deal with grief and loss or certainly things I've spent a lot of time thinking about the last couple of years. So I appreciated that, um, level to it and just like, it looked really cool and beautiful. So it was fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we watched that just in the last couple of days and, uh, I, I ended up enjoying it more than I thought I was going to about like midway through the movie. I thought, I thought it kind of stuck a landing that I didn't know it could even stick at that point. Um, if that makes sense. But, uh, cause like I, I thought it was a little amorphous in the middle, um, uh, in some ways, but like I was, I liked it and I thought all the performances were good. I think it was just dealing with a problem of not having the, who had been the lead of the last movie available and like they were doing their best with what to deal with that as you could, but it's just, it's very noticeable, you know, but, uh, but I did think like Mia said, it, it addressed grief and stuff. And, uh, I think I appreciated that they continued the story of talking about indigenous cultures and how they might have evolved in a different world, you know, but um, the, the movie I was going to talk about actually though, was the Fablement, which I just saw this afternoon finally. And I'm still kind of like processing it. Like it was, it was a weird movie. I don't know if any of y'all have seen it, but um, you know, it's, it's sort of like the somewhat autobiographical story of Steven Spielberg becoming a filmmaker and like the family dynamics that were in his house. I don't know how true to life it is, but it definitely feels very personal. And, you know, it's, it's always, I, I think it's just interesting to watch such a personal movie from someone who we all know as like the biggest blockbuster filmmaker uh, of our lifetimes. And like, it, it's just a different scale. And I, he's done other movies that are smaller and stuff, but like, this is obviously the most, um, you know, personal in terms of like being literal about being personal. Like I, there's elements from this movie that are in all of his greatest movies of like, cause he, he so often dealt with, you know, childhood and parents being weird <laughs> and stuff like that. So uh, it, it's sort of him coming back around in a way and saying like, this is what I was talking about in all those movies. I'm kind of telling you more upfront of what it is, but it was an interesting movie. It's like one that I think I'll end up appreciating more the longer I think about it. And if I read more about it or even see it again, but yeah, I, I recommend it. I haven't seen it yet, but my parents just saw it. My mom uh, said something really interesting about it uh, that stuck with me, which is that, uh, that she said that she enjoyed the filmmaking a lot more than the film itself. I don't know if you, felt the same way but hard to say at this point okay. um but <laughs> we'll I, I think back. i could get that though I, I get that um yeah anyway um so for those who may not have listened to the show before this is a podcast where we usually discuss movies that have appeared on sight and sound magazine's poll of the greatest movies ever made that comes out every 10 years this time though we are discussing a film that one of us thought should have been in the running for the latest list which came out at the end of last year. And again, that film is Boyhood, and it was my pick, just to get that out there. But before we get into the history and background of the movie, what did each of us know about it going into this viewing? Who had seen it before? And if you hadn't, what were you expecting, if anything? And again, since I picked this one, I'll start us off and also remind everyone why I chose it. 
Um, so yeah, I did see this when it came out in 2014. I was very excited to see it because as I remember it anyway, it sort of kind of appeared on the festival circuit or something. And it was this kind of big reveal of like, did you know that Richard Linkletter had been doing this for 12 years? Probably not because most people didn't. And it just sounded so intriguing, especially having seen his other movies and knowing that he likes to deal with time and aging in a way. And he'd done that. Um, at that point, I think, um, had he done, yeah, all three, I think all three chapters of the before trilogy were out at that point. I think the last one had come out the year before. Um, but obviously that one had been shot while they were making this, which is interesting. Um, and yeah, having seen it at least a couple more times since then, I think that this is, this was my fourth time seeing it. Um, and yeah, like I said, I'm a fan of link letter and what he's done. And my reason for really picking it and why I think I've connected with this movie is that I did grow up in Texas as well, uh, like the main character. And we were moving around a lot because my dad would get transferred or have to go to a new job or something like that. So I can I could always really relate to um, the uh, that feeling of like being uprooted and not knowing what's next and kind of having to find your place. And so I know that that's why like it first appealed to me other than just like the good filmmaking and everything like that. Uh, but I'll, I'll save the rest for, I, I feel like I'm noticing new things in this viewing. So I'll come back around to that. Um, and Max, you want to tell us? Yeah. Uh, so I'd seen it before, but only once before. And that was when it was uh, originally out. I remember seeing it at uh, the Kendall in Cambridge Um and and loved it at the time, and I was looking forward to seeing it. Although I did, um, I did go back in a little bit with a feeling like when I see movies these days that I really liked, even though it only came, that movie Boyhood came out nine years ago, because technically it started filming what twenty one years ago or something. Um, I found that movies that I loved in even like the late nineties, I'll go back and revisit, and they age atrociously so i had a little bit of that uh concern which which uh was unwarranted it turned out um specifically i had a weird uh incorrect memory of for some reason i thought i remembered the film being made either partially or entirely on digital camera and having and i thought that that was going to be one of the things that felt really dated to me and i was so relieved as soon as the film started i was like oh no this is actually like you know, proper, pro proper filmmaking quality. I don't know. Uh, I mean, the digital camera thing, I think, has worked for very specific uh, kinds of movies, but I was not looking to sit through three hours of of it. So I'm glad that I didn't have to. Um, yeah. yeah. And I, I know that Linkletter has said that, that they specifically decided to shoot this on 35 millimeter film because they knew that that would be a constant quality throughout the process of making a movie over 12 years whereas digital changes so often that he thought that you could end up with 12 different looks over those 12 different years of storytelling which he thought would be distracting and take away from the whole project um but over to alicia why don't you tell us about your th thoughts going into this viewing uh yeah i have seen it before i saw it on an airplane flight from back from panama back to new york in 2015 and they actually played it for everyone on the plane to watch it was like we didn't mm. have a choice of anything they just played it <laughs> um, but it was really good i really enjoyed it and it was definitely one of those experiences where you watch a movie on an airplane and you cry for whatever reason <laughs> um i mean it's an emotional movie anyway um and yeah i really enjoyed it i like that it is a story of a, of a childhood but it's also a story of like young parenthood and um, it that added dimension to it and the focus on the parents and the children, I think really makes the movie very meaningful. And uh, yeah, there are things I, I identified with in it a lot as well. Um, just like having parents, you know, that were, they had, my parents had me when they were very young and they split up and then you're sort of at the mercy of like, them trying to work out their own lives <laughs> while mm -hmm. you're trying to work out your life, you know, and, and sort of the problems that can ha happen there and the learning experiences that can happen there. So yeah, I, uh, 
that was my experience with it. So I was excited to rewatch it. And Mia, how about you? It's it's something about being high up that makes you cry on airplanes. I read something about it once because yeah, I'll watch like any movie on a plane and I end up crying. So yes. um, I mean, this one you know it's a tearjerker, anyways. But um, I I think this is my third time seeing this movie and I love it. I think it's like it's just such a great movie. There is definitely new stuff I noticed this time. I think this is my first time watching it since becoming a parent. So I think there was a lot of added dimensions there that hadn't hit me quite the same before. Um, But yeah, I kind of Max also went into it with like, is it going to be as good as I remember? And it totally was. So yeah. All right. And Steven. Um, Yeah, this is the second time I've seen this movie. And I believe the first time I might have seen it with you, Jeremiah. Um, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I remembered walking into it, not really knowing a lot about what the movie was going to be about. But I know Richard Linklater, I've seen a few of his movies. I think School of Rock was one that I really loved that he did in Days and Confused. Um, But yeah, I I walked into it and I was kind of like, these are the same actors that are playing um, the same parts as things kind of get get on. And so I was just really amazed at the filmmaking and how that was actually accomplished and just seeing them grow up. I can't say that I really identified with them that much. And maybe it was just because, you know, I was just in a different headspace at the time. Um, And also my parents were a lot older when they had when they had me and I have uh, four other brothers and sisters. So it was a completely different kind of perspective. But but overall, I really did like the movie a lot. And it, you know, it still kind of uh, resonated with me, just some of the little things. And I did notice things here and there that I wouldn't have noticed, I think, when I was um, younger at seeing this movie, even though it wasn't that long ago. It was probably like nine years at this point. But yeah. Right. I'm pretty sure that's one of several movies that I saw with you and I've seen with others here, too, at the Chelsea uh, Cinemas, which I think uh, closed and is being sold. So... Oh, is it? Yeah. I didn't know that. Know that. Yeah, no. So sad. that's kind of sad. I hope someone mm. buys it and keeps it as a theater. Uh, but who knows? Um, okay. So that's where we stood on the film before watching it for this episode. And we will get more into the film in just a moment. But first, let's take a break. And we're back. Boyhood tells the story of a young boy, his slightly older sister, their divorced parents, and the people who come in and out of their lives over the course of 12 years from the time the boy is six until he's 18. Step parents come and go, or even stay. Many moves are made, and we see the ways in which the parents' decisions and actions affect their kids until they begin to have more agency and independence. The story is told a year at a time, and of course, the special thing about it is that it was also filmed a year at a time. So we see every main or recurring character actually age as the film progresses. The effect of the year-by-year production schedule is that each section of the film is something of a time capsule of both the era when it was shot and the time in each cast member's life, thus lending an air of docu-realism that could never be achieved if it had been filmed more traditionally as something of a period piece. Linkletter, cast, and crew would shoot for a few weeks each year, with the script being written as they went to take into account where the actors were in their lives, and to some extent, what was going on in the world and culture from year to year. The film was budgeted at $200,000 per year of shooting, or $2.4 million total, and ended up earning $57.3 million, making it a box office success, especially when considering that it was never in more than 775 theaters in the United States. Critical reception was also strong, with many naming it the best or among the best films of its year. Sight & Sound Magazine, for the record, pulled 112 international contributors and colleagues to decide their top 20 films of 2014 and ranked Boyhood number one. The film also won the top prize of the year from a number of other critics groups and other organizations. And Patricia Arquette and Ethan Hawke received much praise for their portrayals of the estranged parents in the film. It was nominated for six Academy Awards, but only won one, Patricia Arquette for Best Supporting Actress. Its other nominations were for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Supporting Actor for Ethan Hawke, Best Original Screenplay, and Best Film Editing. The big winner at the Oscars that year, though, was Birdman. And just to give a sense of what was popular in that far-off year of 2014, the top five highest-grossing films at the U.S. box office were, from top to bottom, Guardians of the Galaxy, The Hunger Games, Mockingjay Part 1, Captain America Winter Soldier, The Lego Movie, and Transformers Age of Extinction. 
As for our purposes on this podcast, again, I chose this movie as one that I thought deserved to be in the conversation of the best films for the 2022 Sight and Sound poll. I chose it back before the 2022 poll was out, and as it turns out, it did not make the list. That said, of the ballots that have been made public, I did see that director George Miller had it in his top 10. And again, since this was my pick, I'll start us off with my thoughts on the film and whether it lived up to my memories of it. And I have I think I've had a similar experience each time I've watched it to what I think a couple of y'all said, maybe, maybe Max and Mia, of just wondering if it was going to live up to those expectations that I've had. Uh, and each time it has. So I think that's a good sign. And it did again this time. And just like Mia said, uh, since we are parents together, I had a similar... <laughs> A similar feeling of like seeing it from a new perspective um, and kind of recognizing what was going on for the parents a little more this time than I ever had before because I had not had that experience the three times I've seen it previously. Um, and so that was that was interesting for me. I'd also like never really like clocked the fact that um, another thing I have in common with the character in the film is that I would get dragged to my mom's college classes and uh, on days when I was off from school, when she went back to school, uh, when I was in like middle school, I guess. And so if I didn't have school that day, but she did, I would go and sit in the hallway. And I don't think I ever sat in the classroom like Mason does in the movie, but like that felt very familiar to me still of kind of getting dragged along to what your parents have going on in their lives and kind of, you know, maybe it's interesting, but maybe you also just don't want to be there because you have your kid shit to do. Um, and I, I just remember I would tow it around a big backpack full of, uh, schoolwork if I had it, but also a ton of comic books. And I probably never did the homework. I just sit there and read comic books until my mom came back out and got me. Um, and yeah, so uh, li like I said, I just, I, I really love this movie, um, for the reasons I stated pr earlier in the show and the ones just now, Steven, I guess we all saw it before. So did it live up to the memory? Yeah, it actually kind of um, it kind of built onto the memory that I had of it, and and also you know I guess just getting older in general, <laughs> you sort of do appreciate things a little bit more um, just seeing them again and, and kind of picking out things. But I overall enjoy movies that are just sort of like you see slices of things, and there's certain things that were not said, but you sort of get the context of what had happened. Um, and, and just kind of being dropped into somebody's life, um, was just really enjoyable to me and just mm -hmm. seeing the progression of people growing up was just sort of like, you know, the kids changed and the adults even changed. And I think I really picked up on that a lot more than I did before just thinking like, oh, this is just a movie I'm seeing. But this time I felt like they were actually more real people just because you saw the parents kind of struggling with who they were. Um, and that's not typical of a lot of movies that I've seen. Um, a lot of the times the parents are a little bit more all knowing unless it's a part of what the movie is saying that they're flawed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they they didn't always make the right decisions or, you know, they didn't have all the answers. And I, I was really affected by some of the conversations that they had when the daughter was really upset after being dropped off. And, you know, the mom was like, I don't know. I'm just trying to figure things out myself. And so that mm -hmm. really kind of affected me in that way. Um, and then also. There were some things where I wasn't sure what year it was, and I know there was some there's some cues as to what the music was to figure out what year it was. But um, other than that, like yeah, I had um, some other things that I didn't notice before is that there were a whole lot of people of color in the movie, and I don't know if I would have noticed that in 2014 when I was watching, and and the fact that it was in Texas, and I don't know the portions of Texas, but it feels like there was just kind of a lack of that in general. Um, and then the plot lines, I think Ernesto was the only character that I saw that was sort of like a speaking character that was of color the whole mm -hmm. movie. So um, that was sort of something that stuck out to me. But overall, yeah, I, I really did get a lot more out of it this time. A note for later, if we can go back to it, the er the tiny Ernesto subplot is actually my least favorite thing about the whole movie. Is Ernesto <laughs> the guy who's fixing the pipes and then yes. comes back yes. at the end? Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. There is also, I think, I think Mason's friend who goes to the sleepover with him and gets called a a slur. Um, oh, right. Is, yeah. I think it's also of color. Um, but I think but yeah, I'm not. That does not negate your point in any way, shape, or form. There's not a lot of color in this film. Well, um, it, and, and I guess related to that, one of the things that I was thinking about in terms of how the film is aged is that I think that it would get it would be met with more eye rolls now because. 
because a positive thing that's happened in the film industry since then is definitely much more noticeably uh, a push towards uh, different representation on the screen. And -hmm. I think people are Mm -hmm. tired of watching movies that are just about uh, straight white boys growing up and (laughs) and people are are more and more longing to see the world through a a different set of eyes from their own. So I think that um, that's something that maybe, you know, might have gotten a few uh, a few eye rolls back then, but certainly now I think would be more like like really we couldn't have thought of a a more interesting person to to, to base this around like a, a a more unique life experience. But um, but yeah, I uh, yeah that was something that 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 I did think about. Yeah. Well, Max, since you're already speaking, do you want to kind of tell us any more about your your th- thoughts uh on the film this go around i think one thing that i probably ended up appreciating even more now than when i first saw it even though i loved it when i saw it was that uh over time i've i've come to love uh slower movies uh more and more and especially um almost like what steven said about picking up on on things unsaid um kind of liking uh to a certain degree that a lot of the scenes are really random little slice of life, nothings and not, not, you know, uh, nothing to, to necessarily that felt like it was moving the plot forward. And I think Mm -hmm. it's in those moments that it feels it's most authentic and that these, these characters feel like real flesh and blood, real people. Um, and you invest in them on a, on a deeper level because of that. So, uh, that was definitely something that I think I, I probably was immersed even more deeply on that level. Um, and, and, and that's something that I look for more and more in movies these days that I probably wasn't as much of a priority for me back then. You know, I think that I was probably a little bit more of uh, 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 finally, you know, tuned into to dialogue as, as a writer. I've always kind of uh, growing up. That was one of the first things that always struck me about movies that I liked. And um and I kind of appreciate uh, the, the the power that happens between people and the emotions that are uh, kind of put out there in those in those those gaps between dialogue. Well said, um, Alicia. How about you? Yeah, I really uh, also enjoyed the rewatch. I had forgotten a lot of what it ha- what happens in the movie, so it was nice to see it again and. Um, I'd forgotten how long it was, so that was like a little surprise <laughs> also. But um, no, I really, really enjoyed it. And um, I like that Richard Linklater's process is very like collaborative with the actors. And so I think a lot of the moments become very real because they are a lot of times based on real life experiences. And I like that uh, the movie doesn't, have like these huge moments necessarily i mean it does have big moments but it doesn't it that those aren't the only moments that are focused Mm -hmm. on it's focused on smaller more intimate moments and uh, i also like that like the the thing of making a movie over the course of so many years you kind of don't necessarily and i'm sure he as a filmmaker didn't necessarily know where the movie was going to go um besides the fact this kid was going to grow up <laughs> right. and come of age. Um, so there wasn't really, you know, when you have a script with a certain endpoint, a lot of times you are playing in you are playing to that end point. And so in this case, they couldn't really do that. They had to just kind of be very naturalistic and just be very in the moment of the time that they were doing each year. So I find that really interesting. Mm-hmm. And um and yeah, it's just uh it's such a sweet movie but also like there's so much um there's so much like pain in there too and it's very easy as an adult to like forget how childhood feels you know how you felt at the time when you were a child and this movie is very good at um bringing that back and bringing it back in a really uh sensitive way and like a really realistic way Mm -hmm. and yeah yeah really it's it's great. Enjoyed it very much. And Mia. Yeah, I mean I I agree with I think pretty much everything that's been raised and said already. Um definitely the diversity stuck out to me more on this watch, especially having just lived in Texas for two or three years. <laughs> I know. It's like uh <laughs> um, but you know, 
it, it, yeah, I wonder if things would be different today if it, if the movie was being made now. Um, mm. Just a couple of things that I haven't gotten mentioned that jumped out to me, but I think the second most impactful moment to me in the film on this watch was when they leave when she leaves her second husband and they leave the other kids. And, you know, I was just like, oh my God, like just so floored by that. And like, I totally get it. Like she can't take those kids. She has no right to them. Like, and she needs to worry about her own children, but just that scene of them leaving and the kids standing at the top of the stairs, like just like gutted me on this huge level. And like, I don't even really, I knew she left him. Like I remember that happening, but like, Mm -hmm. I didn't, really think about it from like the kid's perspective when I watched it before. And so, yeah, that just like was just this moment that really stood out to me of like, oh my God, like, and then it never really, you know, gets discussed again. It's just like something that they move Mm -hmm. on from, um, which is fine. You know, it's fine. I, it didn't need to be like a theme throughout the rest of the movie for me really, but you know, it was just, for such a devastating moment to then like never have it come up again, you know, it was just like, Oh wow. And for her, I'm sure for like the mom, but also for the children were obviously very close with their, you know, little step, step, uh, sibling friend people. Um, so anyways, that was just like one thing that really jumped out at me on this watch. Yeah, totally. yeah, they called them mom and dad. I think. Yeah, like, yeah I was kind I of noticed that on several occasions. Yeah, I was kind of yeah. surprised by how quickly they they start calling the step parents mom or dad. It was, it was, I don't know. It just seemed like like a lot. I got the vibe from the stepdad that like he was probably like, "You're gonna call me dad because like your actual dad is trash," and you know. So, and I think <laughs> the um, what is the mom's name? I'd want to say Patricia Arquette, but that's obviously not her actual name. Was it Olivia? Yeah, it's Olivia. Olivia. I felt like Olivia was kind of just like, I'm going to go along with whatever you're proposing here. So, yeah. Right. Um, I liked in that situation that the, you know, so many movies that have abuse in them, a lot of times you see the kids or the mother like fighting back and like having these like, you know, moments where they stood up to the abuser and whatever. And this movie, I mean, it kind of has that, <laughs> but the kids never really challenge him. The kids are just kind of like, ugh, you know, like, <laughs> this kind of sucks. I thought that that was very real. I'm sure that that's probably how it is most of the time when you're in a situation like that. You're just kind of like, yeah, I don't know what to do about this guy. Like, he's acting crazy. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm in this situation. Like, you know, I- I'm a kid. Like, what can I, like, you know, you're just very powerless and very, um, yeah, you just have to kind of deal with the decisions your parents make, and I I like that they they lent into that. Yeah, I, it's like the any standing up to him happens off screen, you mm-hmm. know, and we see mm-hmm. the results mm-hmm. of it here and there, but we never explicitly really see it ex- in, until she's in full reaction mode of like, dis- and even then it's off screen because she disappears, and you're like, what the fuck is happening right now? These kids are just like huddled in this room, um, just for safety's sake i guess and where'd she go and the the father is trying to figure it out from them like interrogating them and all um and then she just shows up and takes them you know so it's it's kind of a it's kind of wild how little they show of of her dealing with her husband the kids don't really challenge him like you know like if somebody took me to get my hair cut and i didn't want to get my hair cut like i definitely probably would have said something (laughs) Yeah. But when you're in this situation where the, you know the outcome is going to probably be worse if you do say something, I like that they just have the kids being, you just see the kids being like cowed by this guy and how mm-hmm. how big of an impact he's having on their, you know, self-esteem and their growth. And Right. Well, I, I think that, that that comes from like something that I think the movie does very well that I, I think I heard Linkletter talk about this because I watched the movie almost all the way through again with the commentary on Criterion. And I, I want to say that's where I got this from. But um, basically, if you if you think about it, Mason is not even the main character of the movie for a lot of the movie. He only really yeah. becomes the main character at, towards the end, the deeper you get into it. because And that's kind of how life is as a child in a lot of ways. You know, you don't feel empowered 
to mm-hmm. stand up to people. Mm-hmm. You don't feel like you totally know what the hell is happening around you and why the decisions um, that are affecting you are being made. And you don't have agency uh, to a large degree. And so I think that that's like why what you were talking about, Alicia, Mm -hmm. kind of works is that I think anybody who's been a kid can can, uh, recognize that and relate to that if they can remember what it was like to be a kid and not have that agency themselves. One thing I did want to go back to is the representation thing. Like I was trying to place it in my head. I think by this point, the Oscar so white campaign and, and stuff had already begun maybe around then, or it, I think it was in progress, but yeah, obviously if they started making this movie 12 years before it came out, like it wasn't going to have a huge impact on the production of, of the film. Uh, but I do remember that, that I think it got dinged by quite a few people uh, when it came out for it being about a boy and people were like, why not girlhood? That was like a big thing, which I kind of like, I get that. But I, I, I also think that this movie is very much an expression of Richard Linkletter's idea of childhood. So I think it would potentially ring false for him to make a girlhood movie. Like I think that someone could do that, but like I'm not sure if he would do as well with that. Like, does and, anybody have thoughts on well, that? Well, and I think he's that kind of filmmaker too, where his his most successful kind of low key slice of life movies almost always you can tell that he's he's seeing his own reflection in, in at yeah. least one of the characters. Um, I don't think that I, I'd be hard pressed to think of a movie that he's written where there's where it's it's based around a character that would be totally unrelatable to him. I think he's just a very personal filmmaker like that and, and, and does lean into the more autobiographical aspect. Totally. Yeah. yeah I mean I think Ethan Hawke has often been his his on screen persona. Um you know, like in, in the before movies, even somewhat in this, I think. I think there's a bit of him in both the father and the son, which I guess makes sense when you think about it. It's funny because personally, like Days and Confused, I actually identified with that movie a lot more than I did with this one. Just because I grew up in a really small town in New Hampshire. And a lot of times there was nothing to do. So you had to figure out what you were going to do on Fridays and Saturday nights. Um, but in terms of this movie, when I watched it, I, I do consider it a movie. And it was his perspective that we were seeing. So, like, I didn't really find it offensive as saying, like, oh, well, you know, it's a perspective of a middle class, like white family, and this is what their journey was. So I accepted it in that degree. But yet, like they were in a broader world. So I feel like there should have been more of that, that world, even though it is your insular when you're a child. But yet, even as he became more of an adult, like we still didn't see a lot of like different perspectives or a lot, you know, it still was kind of a narrow view. Yeah. And Ernesto does not help that case. (laughs) <laughs> no, no, like the white savior bit yes. of that oh is god. like, oh That's my right. god, Thank you. and yeah, it was a little definitely cringy. On All right. it was yeah, I know. I, yeah. I I do think that that moment is there more to just show her kids, like it. He, yeah, that that mm-hmm. sh- their mother has done something with her life. Yes. you know, like it's there for them to appreciate that. But I I don't disagree yeah. that it's like a little clunky, especially in retrospect now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a sweet moment at heart, but like, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. For, totally. I mean, first of all, there's, there's no more privileged and condescending thing you can do than to go <laughs> up to the help at your own home and tell them that they should be in school without any thought True. for what their personal totally. circumstances are. And also totally. if we're going to get like really more into the practicality of it, she pulled him from what, like a, a plumbing or construction or landscaping job and his big success story is that he ended up daytime managing a restaurant. Go back, son. You were probably making more money. <laughs> daytime shift. Daytime shift. <laughs> he gets to wear a tie at this job, so it automatically means it's a better job. I mean, yeah. just that just means that you're even more beholden to someone else. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I agree with you. It's it's a corporate job like that is definitely not fun. Restaurant industry is not fun unless you're like probably the head top chef or something. And even then right. it's probably not that fun. Even then it seems miserable. <laughs> he would be more likely to eventually own his own successful landscaping company or whatever than to than to what? Own own a successful restaurant? What are the statistics behind that? I mean, at least it wasn't New York City, but come on, for real. Yeah. 
People <laughs> always need plumbers. They don't always need restaurants, as the last few years have shown us. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he was able to comp their meals. So, you know, yeah, he must yeah. have some sort of power. Well, yeah. you know, maybe Ernesto just had allergies, so he had to get out of that line of work. You know? like, <laughs> allergies? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, he had allergies to pollen and stuff. Oh, oh. <laughs> like, it is like, but it is in the sun. I mean, besides the thing of going up to your, you know, your landscapist, or I thought he was doing their air conditioning I, or something. I thought it was a plumber. He was plumbing. Yeah, he was he was plumber. Plumber. Even more specialized. Yeah, yeah, but to go up and say something to, to that person, and also to assume that they didn't already go to school exactly How do you know he yeah, didn't yeah, go exactly. to school like he could have a master's in fine art you like you have no idea what his life is i mean i i think now that we have lived in texas i my my assumption is that they're general contractors that got called out to work on this like they probably do plumbing uh anything that just whatever they could get paid for sure. like that 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 was the vibe I got, which we have interacted with Mia and I uh, in our time in Austin. Stop um, it! <laughs> Stop we talking there. about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, we don't need yeah. to go down into the lack of licensure licensures and regulations in the state of Texas as relates yeah. to boyhood. <laughs> no, we don't. I agree, though, with the point. I think the intention is to show, you know, oh. She has done this thing. She inspired somebody. Exactly. She's making the world a better place. Their mom is important, you know, even in this small way. It's just an awkward scene, though. Like, she takes the news really awkwardly, Mm -hmm. and the kids are just kind of like, okay. Like, I don't know. Not that it needed to be some super over-the-top, like, wow, mom, did you see that? Or, you know, that wouldn't have been real, but it's just awkward. I was just watching it. I was like, ugh. Oh, wow. That's amazing. More breadsticks, please. (laughs) Pretty much. He doesn't even say like, oh, I'm so glad you did that. Or that's great. Congratulations. Yeah. She's just like, oh. That's because Patricia was not having it. She knew. Yeah. 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 She knew. She barely remembered the guy. She probably says that to everybody that comes by to fix her place. You should get a, you know, you should get an education. (laughs) You know, so she probably says that all the time. And then like, oh, someone actually. She's like, it finally paid off. Yeah. Yeah. I will say as a child of a teacher, sometimes people do come up to your parent and just be like, oh my gosh, you were my whatever teacher and, you know, 20 years ago. And it is kind of like, okay, <laughs> great. Like it, it great. might be a little gen- <laughs> it might be a little bit generous though, because I mean she's not being approached as a teacher though. She's being approached as, oh, you're the woman right, that, that's that told me that I should be in school instead of working on your house. Yeah. That is that's true. true. That is true. Um well, I, I I did want to come back around also to uh, like I know I know something that was talked about I think a lot when the movie came out is, and I think we've kind of touched on obliquely in our discussion so far is the 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 way this movie is different from other movies, especially coming of age stories. Um, there there are so many stories I think Linkletter talked about in interviews, maybe even on the commentary I listened to of how. People have talked about that camp out scene when they're in the uh, under construction house and like how everyone goes into that scene expecting someone to like lose an eye or something and then Mm -hmm. nothing happens. And you're just sort of like, oh, yeah, in life, sometimes just shit doesn't happen. And that's what this movie is about. Uh, But but like I do find it interesting that that is in the same movie as. I don't know if it just hit me harder this time, like for whatever reason, but like the the scene where the dad throws the glass, like I don't think I ever like clocked how fucking dangerous and insane that moment is uh, as I did this time. But I, I, there is danger in the film. It's just it's it's sort of like diffused somehow. I don't know. What, what's everyone's thoughts on that? Well, half the time when they're out with uh mason senior they're like riding around and like whatever his car is with no seat belts and no which maybe yeah. is just the the time of the movie too you know but um yeah i think there's a lot of danger throughout the film you know it might be more i guess diffuse is a good word for it i think that scene as i'm recalling is at least like the it's less dramatic though, yeah you know it's not mm-hmm. there's not that yeah. dramatic tension like, and and I do remember the experience of watching that scene in the theater the first time and feeling like something was going to happen and then being relieved when it didn't for, for two reasons of like, I'm glad that no one got hurt, but also like, I'm glad this movie didn't go that way. It like it zagged where other movies would totally zig into it and just mm-hmm. like, and become about 
the disability this kid got because of this moment in his life or something. You know, it would just be like a whole thing. I think I think movie and TV tropes have really re- rewired us to expect that stuff. Totally. Um, exactly. Totally. I was going to say that too, Mac. Yeah. I'm always pleasantly surprised and it's been happening more and more a lot when I'm watching a TV show or a movie show. And I almost think it's a reflection of my own anxiety, but I'm always, whenever there's like a, a, a suspiciously quiet scene, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop, like something dreadful is about to happen. Mm-hmm. And I'm always so relieved and happy when it doesn't, because I'm almost like, I feel like that would have been a really forced plot device versus like, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, about being in a moment with people and not having necessarily an outside force interfere in that moment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like that when um, the daughter was, I think she had was hung over and they were like, she's pregnant. And I was like, oh, my God. But then, like, at that point, I was like, yeah, they're not going to go there. And they didn't. So, you know, there were just certain things like what Max said is true. It's like whenever anything sort of dramatic could happen, I was expecting it to happen, but it didn't. And so it was just kind of refreshing in that way. Yeah, I also thought it was really true. I mean, there's been so many times in life when I've been in some sort of situation that just one little difference and, you know, who knows what would have happened. Like we could have been dead. There's so many times car accidents could have happened and all sorts of stupid stuff. And then they just don't happen. Things are okay. You know? (laughs) Yeah. When I think back on the number of times I could have died or like seriously injured myself and I just didn't like, I, that's, it's kind of nice that that life works out that way sometimes, but so far it doesn't usually in movies. So yeah, well that's, that's, what's nice about this one is that it is, you're seeing more of just like a process and a journey and you're not seeing just like a big story. Right. Um, yes, yeah, so I appreciated that. Well, I, I think this leads into my big question for the group that I, um, so like I said, for me, a lot of why boyhood works is the way it plays against a lot of the usual tropes of the coming of age stories we're discussing. Uh, but do you think it could have worked at all? In the same way, if it had been shot on a more traditional production schedule and with different actors playing the kids as they grow up, um, how much work is the way this movie is made actually doing? A lot, I think. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's hard to know what it would have been if they had done it in a more traditional way. I mean, I think they would have had to have more of a tight script and they would have had to do it in a you know, a certain compressed amount of time because they would have had, you know, a certain, you would have wanted to stick with the person at a certain age, unless you're using different actors, which would be its own other weird thing. But I think it's cool to like be experimental with storytelling and it puts, it takes some limits away, but it puts other limits on what he was trying to do So, yeah, it's just very different. It's, like, impossible to know. But I do think it plays a big part in in perception of the film and how it turned out and all of that. Right. And is that because it sort of short circuits those that that rewiring that Max was talking about that we've all experienced because of movie and TV tropes? Yeah. And I think it's similar to, like, I was listening to a podcast about um, before sunrise actually just the other day and they were talking about the same type of thing where he just it's about these moments and it's about this like experience and it's not it's it doesn't play into like these tro- it doesn't go where you expect it where you would expect a movie to go right. about childhood and yeah for me anyway blah 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 steven um, an interesting thing my brother said to me when um, we were talking about this movie, this is a long time ago, I think it's when it came out. And I said, Oh, did you see this? You know, did you see boyhood? And what'd you think? And he's like, I thought it was kind of boring. It was, um, you know, it was just sort of stuff was happening. And I was and I asked him, why did he, didn't you think it was kind of interesting that they use the same kids as they grew up, they just shot it. And it was the same kids. And it was the same actors throughout. And he didn't even notice that he was just like, Oh, I didn't know that they were all the same, you know, actors just growing up. So it is kind of part of it. Like if you're not really invested in that portion of the movie, knowing that they're all the same actors over a period of time, what kind of movie is it then? I think you kind of have to buy into the movie in and of itself if you're going to enjoy it. You know, you know, the fact that there are different actors, maybe it would have been different. You know, it's hard to tell. You kind of have to be invested in the story itself. And it it adds to it, I think. And it would be a different movie if they did have different actors. But I feel like you have to 
kind of accept it to some degree in order to, you know, get something out of it. So your brother thought basically like there is a casting agent out there who is like the the best casting agents in the world. Because yeah, I don't or, know how like I, I just can't imagine not noticing that, I guess. I'm not trying to say anything about your brother, but I just can't imagine not well, noticing that. I feel that. like people people watch movies in different ways. Like they sure. have pay attention to movies or, you know, they're on their phones when they're watching movies. Yeah. So they're Yeah, that's you true. Know, that's true. If, if or, he was they, finding they, it boring, maybe it just wasn't paying yeah. attention to that aspect. Yeah, that, and, and sure. technology is so that you can, you know, you can see Robert De Niro when he was 20. So, I mean, the, the, the can you? The can, can you? Really <laughs> do that? Um, I think that obviously the unique way that it was shot and developed contributes to how interesting and unique the movie is. I think that Richard Linklater still would have made an amazing movie if he just did a coming of age story and shot it in a more traditional way. Like when I was thinking about this question earlier, it really made me think about Moonlight and which has, you know, six different or, you know, two main characters throughout the movie played. I think they're all, I haven't seen it in a few years, but I think both guys are in every part of the life, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, So six main characters essentially. Well, you know what I'm saying? Two main characters, six actors. There like we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like, I mean, obviously Moonlight is like in a lot of ways, like a very different movie than this one, but like pretty similar in some ways too. Like it's a boy growing up in his life and discovering who he is and all of this. So um, I think that maybe the boyhood shot in a style like that, like potentially still could have been a really amazing movie and maybe been more similar to Moonlight, at least like in the structure and stuff, which for some reason is how I remembered this movie. I didn't realize, I kind of forgot they shot like a little bit every year. I thought it was kind of like this time and then jump ahead and then, okay, stuff for a little while and then jump ahead again. So that was a pleasant surprise to me too with this one. I think too, though, to Max's point about having different actors again like Richard Linklater is like one of the greatest filmmakers of like our time in my humble opinion so like I think it still would have been a really good movie but I was reading some about the actor who played Mason and you know I think he brought since they did shoot a little bit at a time and I think he knew I think Richard Linklater knew the ultimate direction of where the movie is going. I think I read somewhere he knew like what the last scene was going to be, but obviously like a lot of the stuff in between, I don't know how much he had it kind of sketched out and was filling in the details and then the actual script from there. Um, But anyways, I think that Mason especially probably brought a lot of unique things just from, I'm blanking on the actor's name, but his life and the thing. Coltrane. Sorry. Eller Coltrane. Eller Coltrane. Um, Because I think that they are non-binary or maybe trans. I Yes. So Non-binary, I believe. Non-binary. So I think there's a lot of stuff, especially as the Mason character is getting older and like the scenes with the nail polish or having the long hair. And I don't know, but I have to imagine that a lot of that maybe was from his actual life that he was bringing to the role. So potentially a different actor obviously would have been bringing different things to it there. I don't think it would have been bad, but it just would have been different. Also, I've been talking a while, so last thing here, but you know, the um, actor who plays the sister is Richard Linklater's daughter. So I also wonder just how much him watching her, obviously just day to day growing up during this time period, how much that influenced the script and how he was viewing her character. Yeah. First off, I think that it was reported a lot at the time the movie came out that she ke- she kept trying to leave the project. She was like, "I don't want to do this, Dad. <laughs> like, Stop making me do this." That's so funny. And he, he he like convinced her to to stay on. Um, it's like I'm taking away your allowance. You have to stay in this movie. <laughs> you signed a twelve year contract. <laughs> right. It's once a year. Just do it once a year. No. <laughs> it's just your spring break. Calm down. <laughs> She's like, Dad. Well, I th- I think they did find ways to kind of minimize her. Like you know, she goes off to college. She's around a little less, which, which all makes sense. It feels yeah. natural. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't have much else to say past that. I guess. Yeah. Um. I was just going to say, I watched uh, just a small interview with Richard Linklater before we recorded about the movie. And he was saying, basically, he wanted to do a story about childhood, but he had so many 
scattered thoughts about it and he didn't have like one overarching vision or one particular story he wanted to to tell and so doing it this way really was like such a good way to to do what he wanted to do to portray childhood and growing up and um so I just think it's I just think it works out perfectly I don't know what kind of movie it would have been if they had tried to do it in the more traditional sense but I think it was such a interesting idea and interesting concept and it it is just so perfect for the type of story he wanted to tell and the type of thing he was trying to do he achieved Mm -hmm. exactly what he wanted I think so yeah I don't know (laughs) yeah and I know in the commentary he does talk about how he brought some of his life experience to it which I think is clear, but there are specific moments where he's like, I remembered this from my childhood and wanted to find a place for it in the film. But then th- I think the process was that he would meet with the actors, especially the kids and especially Eller um, in advance of shooting and kind of talk through like what's going on in your life. And, and he, he made it very clear that he was like, I think he put it like, I didn't ask you, like, I didn't ask them like what happened to you in school that, yesterday and then put that in the movie. It was like just getting a general sense of like what they were into like what the vibe was like for them in their life and like what just the general sense and trying to put some reality of that into the f- film as they shot it, like coming up that in the, in the weeks following, you know? Um, mm-hmm. So, so that's how it sort of became a melding of his experiences, a kid and Ellers as well. Um, and the other characters too, I think. Go ahead, Steven. I just was going to add that I think the authenticity helped just with having the same kids there and they just became comfortable with each other over the years. It's sort of Mm -hmm. like going to summer camp and seeing the same kids like once a year. You're just like, oh, and then it just adds to the fact that they were kind of close to each other. And I think that would have been lost if they had had just different actors. Not that it wouldn't have been good. It just like everybody's been saying, it just would have been different. Right. Alicia? that reminded me of the conversation that the father has with the kids in the car when he's like, I want to know what's really going on in your lives. And yeah, they're right. like, uh, what's going on in your life? <laughs> he's like, hmm, maybe you're right. Maybe we should just let this happen organically. <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah. yeah, it's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. sort of the thesis of the film. I hadn't yeah. thought about that. Yeah. And then yeah. Mason later on was having that rant about Facebook, which was really kind of interesting because it was sort of like the flip side of that. He's like kind of complaining about the same kind of thing about like just letting things happen organically when it comes to conversation. Right. Okay. Um, So those are most of our thoughts on boyhood. Uh, We'll share our final thoughts on the movie and answer our bonus question after this break. And we're back. So what was everyone's favorite scene or moment or element of the movie? It doesn't have to be like something that happens in the movie. It could be something about the movie. Like you just like the way it was edited or shot or the music or something like that. Alicia, let's start with you this time. I mean, my favorite thing at the time when it came out and, and again, this time was actually Patricia Arquette's performance. I just think she's, she's just so good and she's so natural and she's so (laughs) flustered and like (laughs) you know real and I'd seen her in other things before but I never particularly thought um I mean obviously she's a very capable and good actress but I never like was super wowed by anything she had done before and this time I was just like wow like she was so good in this and I think like especially in the scene I guess it's like pretty much her last scene that she's in where she's like moved into this apartment and the kids are gone or you know he's moving out her time of raising them is it's kind of come to an end on a day-to-day basis anyway and she's just like what <laughs> next thing is my funeral you know and it's like <laughs> she's just like i thought there would be more and it's like that's mm-hmm. such a true that's such a true thing especially like the older you get the older you get you're just like god like it went by so fast like these last 20 years just went by like so fast and how did that happen? <laughs> you know, yeah. So that's my favorite thing, I think. All right. And Max. Well, <laughs> I was actually going to name the same exact scene that Alicia just oh. did. Um, yeah, that that's that scene packed one of the most, uh, the biggest emotional wallops for me. And and I thought was like the best uh, showcase of, of her performance. Um, 
but just felt like a really felt like a really real moment and um and there were so many layers to the things that her character was feeling and i feel like we've all seen some version of that in our own parents when we had to leave the nest and um i thought it was beautiful how it was all conveyed it felt it felt very real and it felt really complex and really true to life all right and mia <laughs> i was gonna say the same scene i'm like crying already <laughs> thinking about oh, it no. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so good and like i think this is why it just hit me so much more like having a baby now and like you know rowan is already one it feels like it's going by like the days are so long sometimes but like the years are just going the months are going by so fast and you know we joke a lot of like oh next thing we know she's gonna be you know on her cell phone going to college doing this and i'm like sometimes it really does feel like it'll be the next thing i read this thing the other day online that was some stupid Instagram account I follow that's like quotes about mothering and parenting or whatever. It's cheesy, but they had a one that was like this whole long thing. But then there was a line at the end that was like, you, you have so much of your children, you have so little of them. And it just really made me think of that scene. And like, you know, you give so much of your life to your children and you know them in this like insanely intimate way but like at the same time you don't and they're their own people um what you're saying right now (laughs) that reminds me so much of did anyone see uh 20th century women yes yes i was also thinking about that yeah and annette benning like her big lament about about her being the mother to her child is i'll never get to see him in the world the way that everyone else does I'll never get mm. that. And and right. that's what she longed for was to see him objectively as a human kind of navigating life without that lens of being a parent. Um, and I can't relate to that because I'm not a parent, but like I, I, I felt it made perfect sense and was an amazing, an amazing concept. So, Stephen, how about you? Well, I wasn't going to name that moment, even though I did like it a lot. And, and, I, and it, it resonated with me a little bit, just like you always thought that there would be more like, you know, you you work up to that point and then you're like, OK, and then you start to think about it. Like, what else is left? <laughs> but um, my favorite moment, there was actually two. One was just like completely just it was so random. I don't know if it was random necessarily, but it was the moment when uh, Mason was talking with that girl from school and they were just right. She was on her bike and they were just walking together. And just that whole conversation yeah. was just like, it was just moving to me for some reason. I don't know if I, I had done the same thing before with some of my friends and I was sort of looking back at myself and, you know, just having kind of a nice, like, get to know you kind of thing. You're not sure if the girl likes you or not, or, you know, what's really going on there? What is she really talking about? But I just really liked that whole movement. And then they just kind of peel off and it was just a moment. And and that was just kind of part of life. You just have those moments every day with your friends. Is that the first time we really see or hear Eller? kind of be a person in the world kind of like how max was saying of like his parents can't see this like this is that's maybe the first scene where we see that happen where it's not like him interacting with his family members or they're nearby or something like i i can't recall if it definitely is but it's the first i can recall um, that's possible and so I, I i do think it's a scene i've noticed I mean, maybe maybe that's why but what's okay. what's your second one steven sorry oh I'll, I'll just be brief it was just the moment when um when the dad was talking to Mason and Mason was asking like, is there any mag- is there really real magic in the world? And then he just makes this talk <laughs> about like the whale and like the, there's, it's the cut their heart is the size of like a car and you could walk through the valves. Yeah. And he's like, no, I met like elves. Like those are real. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> So it's just like they're on two different levels. And I just thought that that was just a, a kind of a fun moment because the kid was like on a completely different level than the dad. But yet you kind of say like there is wonder in the world. There is magic in there if you kind of, you know, tilt your perspective a little bit. But that's not what he was getting at. So I thought that was kind of an interesting. <laughs> right. That was a very yeah, dad I, moment. I remember yeah, yeah exactly. Like that with my parents were like, I just want to know this one thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I I think as a dad now, I watch that and I'm kind of like, I hope I can say shit like that oh, to, for to sure. my kid yeah. at some point and like actually 
put some words to it that way, like where I'm not just sort of like, no, of course. Jeremiah's could be like, of course there's magic. <laughs> Haven't you seen Richard Linklater's Boyhood? Exactly. He probably will um, be. It, <laughs> well, to that point, like I'm going to, maybe this is going to seem like a cop out, but I am going to say that uh, my favorite thing about this movie is the way it was made. And I think that it just like elevates it so much um, and puts it on the level of like great films by like Truffaut and like Pather Panchali, which we talked about on this podcast, it, like these movies that are about watching people age. And this one is like the, maybe the one of the more extreme ways of doing it. Like the only other thing that I can think of this as sort of thorough other than maybe Truffaut's series with the same actor over like a long portion of his life is the up series. If ever, anybody's seen that documentary series yeah. um, where he, uh, what was it? Michael Apted, I believe is the filmmaker. Um, and he, he picks up the story with these seven kids. It's a documentary series that was made, I believe for the BBC. It's mm-hmm. in Britain anyway. And um, so it's this, these kids from this class, when they're seven and you just kind of get the sense of who these little kids are. Um, and he checks in with them every seven years, uh, 14, 21, 28 up to like, I know there was a 49. Um, was there a 56? I don't remember, but, um, it's, it's just, if you watch the whole series, you see characters kind of fall out and come back because they're like, I don't want to be part of this or maybe, they're having a rough time in their life and they can't even be found to be in the, that chapter of the movie. And it's just like the, that in this movie are such like works of art, but also just like the logistics and the commitment to your craft and to storytelling that you have to, to put yourself through is just like astounding to me. And it's just like so incredibly impressive. And it's what I appreciate about the movie. I don't know if I could pick a moment out of the movie, though. I just think every time I watch the movie, it's it's like I notice something different and I'm at a different point in my life. So it just resonates differently, which uh, brings us around to our next question. Uh, as the movie, as far as you're concerned, stood the test of time or another way of framing it. Do you think it resonates today? So, Alicia. Yeah, I mean, so far, I mean, it's only been not even 10 years, but I definitely think it still resonates. And yeah, there are some, there's a clunky moment here and there and they don't necessarily handle, as we've already talked about, they don't handle like diversity well. And so from that perspective, it doesn't necessarily stand up and doesn't resonate for like everybody. But for me, it it still resonates. And I just also wanted to say like, in terms of after you mentioned the up up series, I, I have watched that as well. It's like such an interesting thing in life to like see, to watch people around you age and go through the journey of life with you and like such like a privilege and such like a great thing. And uh, I really appreciate that about this movie that we get to do that with the actual actors. And uh, yeah, anyway, so for me, it definitely holds up. (laughs) (laughs) And Steven. I think it holds up a lot, um, and it just in terms of the the storytelling in and of itself, and how it's put together is just really incredible. And I feel like you know, even if you watch this, you know, ten years from now, you'll still be amazed at how they kind of put together. And it's a very coherent movie, considering just there's a lot of just different moments that happen, and it does tie together because of I think the actors um, are consistent throughout. Um, so yeah, I, I think it does stand the test of time, and I feel like I can watch this again and find some more in there that I haven't seen before, and that's a good that's a good thing. All right, Max. I also agree that it stands the test of time. Although you know, I would say that if it was made today, I would be more curious to uh, to to see someone that was that was more wildly unrelatable to me. Um, to see life from their perspective. I would like to see um, a really different perspective. But that being said, I also think that underneath it all, there is kind of uh, a a universality to this movie in that uh, in so many ways, it's, it's about time and it's about really like becoming a person. Um, And I think that while a lot of uh, the circumstances um, you could talk about being relatable or not relatable, the fact of the matter is if you're, 
if you're here watching this movie or discussing this movie, then then you already relate to it, regardless of your walk of life, uh, on just the level of of you were a kid that experienced seeing life through your own eyes in a certain way and having that evolve uh, and come into focus over time. And even just the way that people talk to you, I think something that you see a lot of the movie that we didn't really talk about is there are so many moments where... Um, where the kids are getting unsolicited life advice from adults. And that's, that's, <laughs> that happens so much when you're growing up. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it, 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 it's interesting that, that uh, it's hard to, to trace people absorbing that stuff and it becoming uh, kind of coded into their DNA, but it absolutely does. You know, it's just a uh, part of the process of becoming a person, you know, a, a fully realized formed person. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I, I I would say that uh, that I think that th- this this moment of uh, of film history right now that it would benefit from maybe the the push to uh, be more inclusive in terms of uh, the perspective being portrayed. But I do think that uh, despite that, there is still uh, something that everyone can tap into on some level thematically. Mia, yeah, I mean, I I definitely think it you know, like other people have said, it's only been out nine years. So it feels kind of funny answering this question <laughs> when normally we're talking about stuff that's been out for decades. Um, but, you know, so far, I think it stood the test of time and I definitely think it still resonates. And, you know, I'm excited to watch this again in five, 10, 20 more years and see what things jump out then or how it has aged over time. It's kind of fun when you know like, oh, this movie is a classic and right away and to be able to engage with it over and over again. It's nice to look forward to that. Hopefully. Aging is a privilege. I hope I get to age with this movie. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, it's actually kind of by design, I suppose, that this movie is the most recent movie we've ever talked about on the podcast. Uh, I specifically chose it because I was trying to like choose a movie that that had come out since the 2012 Sight and Sound poll that I was hoping would be in the running for the 2022 poll. Um, but yeah, I th- I think it certainly resonates for me. I mean, that's easy for me to say as a white man who grew up in Texas. Um, uh, you know, like there's a lot for me to, to identify with in this movie, but like to the points that have been made through our conversation, I would be so thrilled to see a movie of similar scope like this being made over time about someone from a completely different walk of life and get that perspective. I think Max specifically was talking about that earlier. Uh, I would love to see that. I hope more people do things like this because it's just I, I I think that this trick, if you want to call it that, will almost always work if it's done well. You know, I think it could be really easy to go off the rails if it's like a, a filmmaker who just kind of doesn't get what 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 the story is and or the lack of story even maybe. But um, I, I think that if if there are filmmakers who are willing to go out and do something like this of this scope. Uh, I would love to see um, other people's stories on the screen and get to interact with those um, the same way I have been able to with this one and learn about somebody else's circumstances. Uh, I would love that so much. Um, But I I do want to kind of also just address the fact that it wasn't on the 2022 um, list, which I find astounding. And especially as we're recording this, this past week, uh, they released the top 250, so they, they an expanded version of the list, and it wasn't even on that. And I was just kind of like so mm-hmm. shocked by that. That's crazy. I, I do wonder if this is more like a filmmaker's film, though, because of it being such an astounding feat of filmmaking in in a specific way. So, I, as far as I know, they haven't released like the the similarly expanded list of the director's survey. So I, if they do, I'll be interested to see if it's on that. And if there are more filmmakers like George Miller who had it on their list. Um, and I, I'm just curious because it's just kind of crazy to me that it wasn't anywhere to be seen at all. But yeah, I have you know. a question because something that you read earlier said it was only shown on 775 theaters in America. 
obviously now it's on streaming things and stuff like yeah. that. But like, was it ever screened internationally? Do you or does anyone know? Oh, I'm sure it was. I just wonder maybe if it hasn't been viewed as much outside of America, maybe. Although, I mean, it was be. nominated for a bunch of Oscars. So I would think that people who are voting on these lists would have a way to have access to this film, even if it wasn't showing at movie theaters. But I don't know. I wonder if that was just part of it. Right. And Sight and Sound magazine listed it as their top movie yeah. of the year. And that was a poll of international critics True. and other mm. Or, or contributors to the magazine and other colleagues of theirs. So um, I don't think it was only seen in America, but that said, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's less accessible outside of the country in more way than one. But like, I, I do think that the scope of the film for me, like does connect it to the movies I already mentioned, like Pather Panchali and some of the Truffaut films and stuff. But even like uh, Mia and I think are at this point, I don't know if Max has, uh, but from the ones who are, usually on the show were, are the only ones who'd seen Jean Dillman, the movie that came in at number one on the critics list in 2022. And I think there's even a connection to that movie oh, for of, sure. it, of it being, being something that takes its time and lets things play out to a degree in that movie that can be very frustrating if you kind of don't know what you're in for, or just like, it's not your type of thing, but that is like true slow, slow cinema in a way. This is slow cinema as well, but it's also like got a different pacing because they got to like get a lot in and each vignette, each yearly vignette. Uh, but there is a connection, I think, of, of it just being about a slice of life for the most part. Don't want to give anything away about Jean Dillman, which I'm sure we'll talk about on this podcast relatively soon. But um, yeah, anyway, I, I, I think this movie deserves to be in the conversation. The greatest films ever made. Just want to reiterate that point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Do you like so, this movie, Jeremiah? <laughs> no, yeah, no, this movie kind of sucks, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. But uh, why don't we move on to our bonus question, uh, since I've gushed enough uh, about this movie. So what movie did you really connect with because it captured something that you could really relate to from personal experience or history in your own life? Steven, let's start with you. I actually couldn't think of one. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I feel like when I, and I was thinking about this through the lens of when I was a kid. So like, I think star Wars, um, not that it, you know, any of that was even plausible for my life, but just the fact that, you know, it was Luke and he grew up somewhere where he wanted to do something else. And then someone whisks him away and he has this crazy adventure. I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. So like that really affected me. And of course that was one of the things that really launched my love of science fiction. And, you know, we used to do a lot of like play acting when I was a kid with my siblings. And so that's a common knowledge or a common language that we all still speak in my family about star Wars since we love it so much. So mm -hmm. that was it. All right. Uh, Mia. So I, when I was thinking about this question, um, I thought about lady bird which in a lot of ways I feel like could be, I mean, it's not the same as boyhood, but like, I feel like they pair together really well. Um, it's a good wine cheese combo. Um, I, <laughs> I love Lady Bird. I think it's like just such a good movie and I really identify with a lot of the, um, if anyone hasn't seen it, she's just like a rising senior in high school and is just kind of navigating like friends and boys and family and going off to college. And uh, yeah, just like the the relationships, like especially with her mom, but her and her dad and really wanting to get out of your town and go somewhere really different and new to start your life and just everything that happens. The soundtrack was also, it was like, I'm, I think Greta Gerwig must be like a year or two older than me. Cause I was like, Oh, this is like exactly like how things were going. Um, so yeah, I just really connect with that movie. All right. And Max. Um, well, kind of a weird answer, I think, but I, uh, I, I, I feel like I tend to see more of my, um, character faults and insecurities in in movie characters than than strengths when it comes to really identifying when if if, if i'm going to like feel a real like emotional gut punch it's it's usually because like maybe i see a part of myself on the screen that i don't uh feel like the rest of the world sees or that i don't i don't articulate or express so um one of the things that came to my mind although this is a really extreme example 
is Punch Drunk Love, Adam Sandler's character. Just kind of uh, just just sometimes moments of 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 social anxiety, feeling uncomfortable in your own skin, uh, having like self confidence issues. Um, obviously, I uh, am hopefully not as much of a basket case as his character was, but um, but I do I do <laughs> kind of uh, I I it really hits me hard when I see a character that is is showing uh, a, a side of humanity that is is not glamorous at all that you don't really see in movies very often because it's unflattering and it and it's really raw like that. All right. And Alicia. Um I'm going to go with Frances Ha, which is another Greta Gerwig movie. <laughs> but um I don't think I knew any of you when I was in my 20s, but like definitely New York in your 20s and acting like an idiot. <laughs> making a lot of impulsive decisions and living in an apartment with two dudes uh, in a place where you probably can't really afford to live <laughs> and having, <laughs> having to be a little humbled by life and uh, grow up a little bit. Yeah. I, Francis Ha is, was definitely a movie that I relate to and that I saw a lot of myself in and a lot of life experience, similar life experience, obviously not a one-to-one, but Yeah. It's a good, it's a good movie and modern love, David Bowie, you know, that scene. <laughs> I don't want to say boyhood because we just talked oh about gosh. it so much. So, um, I, I'm going to quickly mention two movies. I'm going to say Nick and Nora's infinite playlist just because it's not the greatest movie ever made. It's a fun movie. Have you guys seen it? I saw it, but I don't remember it that well. I mean, it's just like it's about it's these people running through the like music scene sort of in Brooklyn at around the same time that I very was much in New York part movie. of that. And yeah. a lot of us were. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. It just felt like familiar in a way. Um, and this might sound weird, but like I think one that like is maybe I feel a little more personally um, is the Florida Project. Oh, wow. I didn't grow up exactly like that. Like I, I had not. a very good home life like my parents were very stable presences in my life and like you know not it wasn't like that it was just more like the idea of like running around with your friends and just kind of being loose in the world like you know i grew up uh in the 80s when i was that age and there was a lot more leniency or or like uh i don't know kids just were running around a lot more i think than they were if i'd grown up in the 90s or 2000s or whatever a little more if I was that age in those decades, you know, so there was just something about that movie and, and the the freedom that little kids had that was recognizable, even though um, it is kind of crazy to watch that movie <laughs> and see how free they are, you know, but uh, yeah. Back when you had an imagination instead of an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember running around in ditches uh, in Texas, like with friends in the, in the neighborhood, because we were like in this subdivision that was still being built or like there are other things being built around our neighborhood. So we'd run through these ditches. Like I remember playing Ghostbusters and putting like a plastic bag on my back and like just carrying a stick and like running out God knows where and like crossing these like giant fields that I should not have been in and stuff. And just I was like five years old and like so far away from home sometimes. And it's kind of that would never happen now. I know it wouldn't. And it probably won't happen with our kid. So it's just a different, different way of living. Um, but anyway, oh, we lived on a we lived on a canal and like everyone had pool. I mean, I grew up in Florida and, and we were always like in each other's backyards and no parents. And like so one time a kid fell in the canal and I fished oh him out. Oh, my God. <laughs> Just like it's just that's just what you did back then. You just like learned how to solve problems yeah. without adult um, interference. Yeah. In our next episode, we'll be picking our sixth round of movies that we'll be watching for the podcast. So come back for that. That's all I got to say. That's it for this episode of Story Actor Movie Club. You can subscribe to the show just about anywhere you listen to podcasts. We invite you to join our conversations about movies by joining our Facebook group. And you can find a link to that along with our email address, links to a lot of the places where you can find the show and other info by going to stereoactivemedia.com slash Movie Club. If you have a moment, please rate and review the show on Good Pods, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else that allows you to do that. It helps others to find the show, and we really appreciate it. 
Also, you can get updates about this show and plenty of other stuff by following Stereoactive Media on Instagram or Twitter. Thanks for listening. This podcast is produced by Stereoactive Media. Stereoactive Media.